There we go. Thank you for all the heroes uh, showing up here. Also, welcome to the people on the on the live streaming and the recording. Um, quickly introduce myself. So, Pascal Robrook, there's only one person with that name, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's very easy. I'm an uh, electronics engineer with uh, maybe one thing special is that I do both hardware and firmware design. So this allows me to do uh, really tightly integrated uh, small projects in a, in a very efficient way. And this is what we did here in this project um, for a group of musea uh, from, uh, from Belgium, Antwerp, um, and uh, the project is uh, going to explain what we did there, and then I'm going to zoom in more and more into the hardware and the software aspect of that project. So, first top top level view is what was the problem that they were facing, is that they want to monitor the environment of the art pieces that they have in their collection, uh, both on a short-term perspective, so let's say that temperature or relative humidity is uh, not good, then they want to get an alarm, but also on the long term, they want to record everything that happened in terms of the environment for an art piece. For example, some pieces can be uh, fragile with too much light, the colors can degrade, so they want to record over the whole lifetime of such a piece of art um, how much light did it get, what were the conditions, etc. It's not just the technical problem, but there's a couple of requirements that uh, they put forward on top of that. And uh, so we need to do real-time data transmission, that's for the short term, and we need to do also a local data recording, mainly because the existing solutions already do the local recording the customer there wants to keep that, uh, that feature in there. We need to have a battery lifetime of at least a year, and we have to use a safe battery technology because most of the lithium batteries are not very safe. Right? That's why you cannot take them on an airplane. Uh, and of course, you don't want to put them next to a very uh, high-value piece of art. Imagine that it uh, starts to burn. That would be a disaster. It needs to be flexible in terms of sensors. So I mentioned temperature, relative humidity, light, maybe uh, barometric pressure, um, particles, dust particles, etc. So the basic idea is to develop a platform where you could extend with additional sensors if the specific case has uh, additional requirements. And then finally, the whole design has to be open source. So any museum that wants to adjust it or improve it um, can take the design and modify it. There is, everything is open, the hardware, the software, and the data storage. So we come to a typical LoRaWAN solution. At the bottom, you see the sensor. This is a picture. I have a few of them in my box here. Um, the gateways that we are using are also fairly standard. We use the Rack Wireless gateway. We did a couple of trials, and this one turns out to work very well. In our case, we use the standard things network stack. That's also uh, very good. What's a bit special, and this is a small intermezzo, is the way that we store the, the data. Um, we could store it in a standard solution like uh, DataCake or uh, InfluxDB. Um, many solutions exist, but in fact, they're all proprietary silos. And also for the data storage, the customer wants to, be, wants to use as much as possible open standards and open uh, solutions. And so you see a number of keywords there, like Oslo, which mean open standards um, for linked organizations. It basically means that all the data that's being collected will be able to be exchanged with other parties if you agree to that. Um, so I'm not going to zoom in on that aspect because it's a different part of the team that takes care of it, but it's really worthwhile to take a look at that as well. Let's uh, take a look at the hardware. So I brought uh, some uh, real uh, live devices uh, up here. Um, how do we make it open source? It's simple, we use open source tools. So the hardware is designed in uh, KiCad and it's, it's made public on a GitHub repository. Uh, you can see the battery technology that we choose. We have a USB-C port where we can recharge the device. We can provide upda firmware updates via that channel. We even have a command line interface to configure the device. 
We have a uh, memory uh, to store the recordings. We have an e-paper display, so you know what's going on, and you can read the measurements on here. We have lots of sensors that we can connect to it. It's basically any I2C sensor, OK? And uh, the device we are using inside for the LoRa is the Seed Studio, um, based on the uh, STM32WLE5. It's a very common chip uh, by ST, so it's, um, it's a good one to use in an open source design. What is the objective that we want to do with the hardware design? Is that basically you can download the repository, you can send it to a PCB assembly shop, and you will get working hardware. And we tried that already twice. And so we sent first to Seed Studio. We got the prototypes. They were fully functional. Then we did a small production batch of 65. We sent to Eisler, a German PCB assembly uh, fab. And they were also 100% uh, OK. So that's our objective. And it seems like it's working. This is some uh, pictures from the, the hardware. I've got it here with me. So after the show, you can uh, take a look. What you see on the left hand is uh, basically what we call version 2. Um, so that's the, 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 the first version uh, that we made in production. But then you see here, it's a, a minimum uh, variant. So the idea of open source is that you can take the repository, quickly modify it, and make a variant. And we did that. This is a very minimum size um, variant that we created from the first one, uh, which does basically the same, except it doesn't have a display, it doesn't have battery recharging. Um, now we're developing, in the other direction, we're developing one that has, oops, that has a bit more features, like we have more memory, and we will have uh, solar harvesting added to it. Uh, there is an, uh, an extra button where we can give input into the device, uh, for example, when you take the art piece out of the storage, you can mark this time by pushing the button. Um, so, you have this standard version. You can derive in a very short time a variant which fits your specific solution. So far for the hardware, eh? and uh, if you're in hardware and software, I think you'll agree that the hardware is the tip of the iceberg, which is above the water. It's very visible, uh, but there is a big thing under the water, uh, and that is the software. And the problem there that we faced is that uh, it was really difficult to take existing software repositories and to make it open and reusable. So we spend a lot of time uh, there as well, but the same objective is that you should be able to download the repository of the software, make some changes to it according to your needs, and get a working device. And that is not easy, but I'll show you uh, how we did it. Okay? Again, we will be using open tools. So at this time, uh, you can choose. Uh, I use Visual Studio Code and Platform I.O. as a development platform because it's free and it's open. You can also use STM32 Cube, uh, which is also free and open. Um, so that, that's OK. Um, we use a technology or a methodology called test-driven design. Um, it means that every time you add a feature or a specific function to the software, in fact, first you design a test uh, to test what it's supposed to do. And uh, as soon as the test is working, then this test goes in the whole batch of all the tests. And the thing is that then, after you change anything to the software, you can automatically rerun all the tests. This way, you're sure that whatever you change here or there, it doesn't introduce a problem somewhere else, and the whole application is still working. So that's all put into a uh, what they call continuous integration, continuous development workflow. It's also part of the GitHub. The software that we uh, use is running on the STM32 chip itself inside uh, the module, so we don't have a separate modem and a separate uh, microcontroller. In order to reduce the power consumption, it's just one controller. Um, a few other things about the software. So at the top level, it's a very simple state machine application, because you need to know what is the device doing and what state are we. And to control all that, the best proven uh, pattern is a state machine. 
It's only 500 lines of code, so it's, uh, it doesn't take months to understand it. All the rest are independent modules. I mean, the display driver, the USB driver, all that stuff is uh, quite modular. We did something special on the sensors because um, many of the devices can do more than one thing, like the BME 680 sensor. It can measure temperature, humidity, barometer, etc. So what I introduced was a concept of a sensor device, like the BME, BME 680, but it has several channels. And so this makes it easy. Basically, this means that any sensor that I have met today uh, can fit in this pattern and can uh, easily work with the firmware. So uh, if you bring in a new sensor, you have to write the firmware to treat it as a new device with some additional channels. We also use, as much as possible, the hardware acceleration. Uh, so the AAS encryption uh, that is used in the LoRa one, it's done in hardware. The random number generation that you need for the standard protocol, it's all done in hardware. So uh, just to show you a few benchmarks, to do the encryption in hardware is about 35 times more efficient than to do it in the software. So I decided to do that in, um, in hardware and to take care of the efficiency, which then returns itself as battery lifetime. We also decided to take a subset of the LoRaWAN uh, stack, because if you take the whole stack, it's like... Uh, you only need 10% of that. We want to do only an application in Europe, so we have only the European part of it, and we only want to do class A. So if you take the pieces that you need, then it's really a limited part. So we have only about 1,000 lines of code for the LoRaWAN implementation. Well, software is more difficult to, uh, to show to uh, an audience, so what I did is a few screenshots of how the continuous integration uh, workflow works. You see here, uh, for example, we did a new uh, test on the, on the UR2, and it's automatically run every time you do a change on the software. It also tracks how is the testing doing. So here you see that we have, at this time, a coverage of around 90% uh, of testing, um, and it's gradually increasing. I'm not sure that I will reach 100%, because in hardware design or firmware design, that's not easy but at least um, you have a good view of what is tested. Also, we are running what is called static code checking. So there is a, already a large number of bad practices known uh, in software programming. And uh, the Sonar Cube is a tool, it's also an open tool that tests your code for all these things. So this is also put in the workflow. You can see that, for example, we have no security issues, but we have six reliability issues, and we have still 409 maintainability issues, means things that I need to work on in order to make the software easier to maintain and easier to reuse by, uh, by other parties who want to, uh, to join the project or to work further on, um, on, this, uh, on this project. I think that's it. Okay, this is final slide. What is the status and the roadmap of what we're doing? It's basically a three-year project, so we had a kind of a proof of concept uh, two years ago. Last year, we developed uh, everything that I show here, mainly in terms of hardware. This year, we're doing field trials that are running right now with 60 units in five sites, five musea, um, that are running to get some feedback. So far, all the feedback is good. And uh, we are doing also working on the dashboard. And for the next year, there are a few things on my wish list, like I want to do maybe adaptive data rate. I want maybe to get into firmware updates over the air. And we are thinking about how to bring this open source thing to a more commercial business model later on uh, if, if that would be uh, a business opportunity. Voila, that's it. I'll be right outside in the launch here. If you want to take a look at the hardware, if you have any more special questions about it, and, um, and that's it for today. Thank you.